First of all, I would like to welcome you all to the FHWA Pavements webinar series. This is the fourth webinar of our series, and today we'll be focusing on FHWA's asphalt program areas. Um, just a reminder, please mute your mics. Um, before we get started, we'll go over, I'd like to introduce our team here today, as well as go over the meeting platform. Um, for those of you who do not know my, me, my name is Heather Dilla, and I'm one of your moderators today for this webinar series. And I'm the Sustainable Pavements Engineer in FHWA's Office of Pre-Construction, Construction and Pavements. In this role, I'm responsible for the pavement design policy and how tools such as life cycle cost analysis or life cycle assessment or um, resiliency can inform our pavement designs. Helping me host this webinar series is Jen Albert, a pavement and materials engineer with FHWA's Resource Center. She has a background in pavement design management sorry payment design and payment management and works with me closely on in the area of payment our payment design policy since january um, 2019 jen and i have been reviewing our payment design policy during this effort we held five peer exchanges with the state agency representatives as well as fhwa office representatives to discuss the state of practice in payment design and any challenges or barriers that existed um, in meeting their agency's missions. Based on the feedback we heard from these events, we created this webinar series. We felt that the topics that um, were all comprised in the webinar series were discussed and of interest by several of you in, in learning more and especially learning what FHWA is doing in these areas. If you have any questions or feedback during the webinar series, please don't hesitate to contact either Jen or myself. Our addresses are noted here. And with, um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Amanda McQueen, who's going to give us a brief overview of M MS Teens. Hi, thanks so much, Heather. Um, I see there have been a couple questions already, but uh, for those who have not uh, joined us for a webinar so far, welcome and thank you for joining us in Microsoft Teams. Uh, for those who have not used the platform that much here, this is what it looks like and in front of you. Some of you may have a slightly more updated version of Microsoft Teams that has uh, the key uh, function buttons at the top uh, right hand corner, but they should look the same. Uh, note the mute buttons, uh, as Heather mentioned, to keep yourself muted unless you're asking a question during the designated question and answer sessions. Um, and during that time as well, feel free to turn on your camera because we'd like to be able to engage with you. Um, but then again, to, to keep that muted until the question and answer portion, uh, feel free to use the raise hand button as well. Um, that is really helpful to indicate if you have a question or a need. Um, and then, of course, the chat pod is the, the best place to share questions, um, any issues you're having, to do that to avoid disrupting uh, the presentation itself. A couple of best practices. We've been in this virtual environment for quite a while. So I will re-emphasize to mute, <laughs> mute yourself if, if you haven't already. Um, some best practices include um, using the chat pod and the hand raise functions to indicate that you have a question. Um, if you do have a technical question, I really encourage you to send me an email at amanda.mcqueen.ctr at dot.gov so I can help you individually. Um, also, if you have a specific question for someone, you can use the at sign in the chat pod to indicate a presenter or to indicate Heather or Jen uh, to a question you may have. Um, again, if you have connectivity issues, uh, the best thing I can recommend right off the bat is to log back out and log back in. Uh, sometimes that's an issue with uh, streaming so much through your computers. Uh, if there continues to be an issue with being able to hear a presenter, uh, to be able to see things um, on the screen, feel free to shoot me a quick email and I'll do my best to help you. Yeah. And I would recommend using a different browser if you if you need to. Uh, that helps as well using Google Chrome, Microsoft Edge, or Firefox. Okay. And it sounds like folks are coming in. Um, again, if you have any questions, let us know. But Thank you very much for joining us and we'll be recording this uh, webinar and we will have that available. Um, if you do want to have uh, 
found it. A copy of the presentation, uh, please just let us know in the chat or via email. Thanks so much, Heather. Back to you. Oh, the hell is it? All right. At this time, I would like to introduce you to our speakers, Dr. McCarthy and Dr. Menching. Dr. McCarthy first joined FHWA in 2002, where she managed the Mobile Asphalt Materials Testing Laboratory and was the asphalt lead um, for the Pavement Design Guide Implementation Team. Between 2006 and 2009, Leslie was the Operation Team Leader for the FHWA Florida Division Office, where she led the team of Area Engineers, ER Program, LPA Program, and had collateral duties with the Pavement and Materials Program. In 2009, Dr. McCarthy became an associate professor in civil engineering at Villanova University, where she served 10 years, and she recently joined us back at um, FHWA in the Office of Pre-Construction, Construction and Pavements as a senior asphalt pavement engineer, where she's currently leading and revamping the Mobile Asphalt Technology Center. Dr. Dave Menching is our next speaker, and he is the Asphalt Materials Research Program Manager for the Federal Highway Administration. He is the director of the Turner Fairbank Highway Research Center's Asphalt Binder and Mixter Laboratory and has research interests in automation and artificial intelligence, connected pavements, resilience, and performance specifications. He is currently the chair of the T Transportation Research Board Standing Committee on Binders for Flexible Pavements and is an active member of the Association of Asphalt Paving Technologists. Dr. Menching holds a bachelor's and master's degree from Villanova and has a PhD from the University of New Hampshire. He's a licensed professional engineer in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And with that, we can call Leslie up to the stage. Okay, hi everybody. Good afternoon um, and maybe good morning, I guess, for some of the West Coast folks. Um, I'm very uh, happy to be able to get a chance to talk with you today and tell you a little bit about um, the ties between asphalt materials and pavement design. So I'm just gonna give you an update on the Mobile Asphalt Technology Center. And um, it'd be interesting to see a show of hands of how many folks have been inside the Mobile Asphalt Technology Center lab. Um, of course, I can't see your hands because I'm presenting right now, but maybe uh, a Jen or, or Amanda might be able to capture that, but just kind of curious how many of you have seen it in your state or seen it at a, a conference um, or actually been to materials training and gone through it in, in that endeavor. But um, it's a, a pretty well known program and I want to tell you about some things that are different about our program. Um, so first I'll start by introducing the team. Um, and so as Heather mentioned, I'm the program manager for the Mobile Asphalt Technology Center. Um, and I have a partner in Derek Nienerplant who recently joined the Federal Highway Resource Center as an asphalt materials specialist. And uh, the project manager is Brendan Morris. And as you heard, I, I worked with this program earlier from 2002 to 2006. And Brendan Morris was our C senior lab technician at the time. So he's got a uh, previous tour with the program as well. Um, we also have uh, a senior laboratory technician, materials lab technician, and field technician, so James, Terry, and Otto. And we have a project engineer, Ram Vira, Vira Raghavan, and he uh, recently finished his PhD at Worcester Polytech in Massachusetts. Um, we also have a few subject matter experts uh, who are working with us in specific areas on specific support we're giving to different state DOTs. And we've got a marketing specialist that's helping us uh, try to spread the news and, and be more effective at helping everybody by providing that communication aspect. Because engineers are not always the best at communications, right? But kind of like an old engineering type joke. Um, so let's start by talking about our goals. In a nutshell, really what we're trying to do is help assist taking viable research products and field evaluating them um, to help them get to the next stage of implementation. And so we take innovative technologies, 
that might be coming from National Academies research projects or from Turner Fairbank Highway Research Center uh, projects or even some state DOT research sponsored projects and looking at um, you know, testing those out in the field, testing them in different states, different materials to try and really get some idea of the rigor of those tests and, and whether or not those are um, things that um, the states would want to implement and how can we support states and their paving partners in, in actually implementing those. And the idea is these are technologies that will support the overall mission of durable, safe, and sustainable asphalt pavements on our nation's highway. So we're really trying to bridge the gap between research and implementation. Um, we have our basic approach to doing that is really fourfold. Um, we start with the project site visits and um, project site visits is, is really what we do, right? It's a mobile asphalt technology center. Although this year we've been the SATC, the stationary asphalt technology center, because we haven't been able to travel since February uh, due to the national pandemic. But we have done virtual site visits and um, we've kept active in that way. I'll tell you a little bit about that further, further on. Um, one of the benefits to having a site visit with a state DOT and their local uh, paving partners is that we are coming in with a national perspective. We've been to a lot of other states and our, our team of technicians have worked in a number of different states and even internationally. And so it gives some, some uh, really learning exchange with the state that we're, we're visiting. Um, in terms of other support, we you do customized training workshops um, and we've really expanded on that. And I'll talk a little bit about that today as well. Um, we use the test results and observations from the site visit to, to help try to give an idea to the state of how you might best implement for the conditions that you're in and the goals that you have in your state. Um, and again, this is, uh, you know, materials, mix, and field technologies for asphalt. We started an equipment loan program, um, and the... Um, we have a mobile concrete technology center, and I know you'll hear from Mike Prowl soon in this series, um, and he'll talk about the, uh, the MCTC. However, they've had a, a equipment loan program that's been very successful for years um, in helping the states try out a technology before they decide to commit to it. And so we've got that just off the ground now, and our first two loans are going to occur, uh, you know, uh, really in, by the end of this month. So I'm talk a little bit about that as well. And finally, providing technical information. Um, we generate topical information documents. Sometimes they're one pagers. Sometimes they might be um, a, sort of a synopsis of a tech brief that may have come out of another area in asphalt materials. And uh, these are based on national trends. So they're either to support um, giving information about new technologies to the state um, in a way that you can actually take that and show it to your leadership. So not the 8, 10, 12 real technically detailed type information documents, but more the one or two page that you could kind of go to your leadership and say, hey, there's this technology. And it gives in a nutshell really what you need to communicate to your leadership. So it's a little bit different than, than some of the more detailed technical documents. Um, so some of our core activities um really that on-site support we not only are state dot's but federal lands highway as well um we we have answered questions from local agencies on occasion try to help give technical assistance there um the development of case examples from innovation trials if you have an innovation trial coming up um we just heard the other day about uh you know the observation of whether you could take recycled materials from wind turbine blades and, and use those in infrastructure. So you know, if you have some sort of interesting case you know, innovation trial that's going on in your state, um, it might be something that you consider asking us to come out and, and demonstrate some of the technologies are. Um, we provide specification review on your QA spec, material spec, or construction specifications, and um, that's something new that we've been doing in the last year and a half. Um, I mentioned the equipment loan program, and uh, we also have a, a division office rotational program as well. And I think there's a number of folks today on the on the workshop who um, are from the 
Federal Highway Division Office. And so there's information also on how you can uh, participate in the rotational assignment, actually come out to a site visit. Or we have other rotationals. Um, we have one that hopefully will be starting soon that will um, you know, just deal with uh, activities that we're doing while we're stationary. Um, in terms of deployment, uh, we've got a quality in the asphalt paving process workshop. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and we are in the process of recording video briefs, and they're more of like tips and tricks on how to use some of the different technologies. So many of you have probably heard of the ideal CT or the AMPT device, and they give um, outputs that some some of the outputs you might be able to use, for example, from the AMPT as an input to your pavement design um, catalog or your pavement design process. And so um, what we're trying to do is come up with real short videos, maybe like you know two minutes or less, that just give you some quick tips and tricks for your technicians in terms of how to run the different um, tests and kind of uh, the different steps, like how do you set it up? How do you prepare it? How do you take the data afterwards and actually process and interpret that? So um, a lot of hoops to jump through. Uh, internally to be able to post those videos, but we're working on that and we're hopeful that it'll bring something a little bit different than the real detailed technical type um, videos that are out there. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, our on-site and, uh, and in-depth uh, off-site activities pretty soon. And also just to kind of, uh, a lot of you may work in pavement design and pavement management and there are ways for us to also strengthen that tie. Um, it, you know, traditionally, we are focused on asphalt materials, but um, there's a lot of things that we're also starting to do now that feed into the post-installed pavement itself and things that could be helpful during the design process. And as such, we kind of think of our program as a pipeline. It's a conduit to try and deploy um, different initiatives and tools from all different types of pavement related areas. And so as part of that, some of the different areas such as pavement sustainability, um, for example, and quality assurance um, and safety, pavement safety, you know, they've come up with um, five year plans on how some of the great products and um, and processes that they're and practices that they're observing in their area could be further deployed when we're out on site um, and working hand in hand with the division office and agencies and industry. It's an opportunity to, to tell more of the story because we're out there on the field. And so obviously a lot of this has to be tailored for the state visit that we're at. Um, things that are of interest to Washington state may be different than things that are of interest to Arkansas. And so uh, our site visit can be tailored based on um, some of the different uh, tools and, and practices that we want to highlight. So in terms of some of the different technologies that we offer, as you can see, they're broken into really three different categories. And these are the different types of equipment that we have available either through our actual lab itself or through our um, stationary partner lab in Turner Fairbank, which is um, the asphalt binder mixture laboratory implementation and delivery. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. Um, but in terms of mixture tests, you can see that we run the gamut of uh, tests that you've heard about. If you've listened to um, the asphalt mix process, which is the um, balanced mixture design. So we have the ideal cracking test, ideal rutting test. We have capabilities to run the um, semicircular bending test, the Illinois method, and also the overlay test. Um, in addition, we have the capability to run some of the more fundamental tests, get fundamental properties such as dynamic modulus, um, cyclic fatigue and stress strain sweep, or stress strain sweep rutting, SSR test um, in, in our lab as well. In terms of materials tests, we have some different tests that you might be able to use for forensic analysis and quality control, such as the X, handheld X-ray fluorescence, which gives us an idea of what the uh, binders markings are or chemical elements. You can also use that for um, looking at um, limestone, looking also at um, pavement markings and a couple other applications that some of the states have been coming up with. Um, ABT is a really 
promising quality control tool to try and confirm that you actually got the binder that you asked for. Um, think it's silly and maybe it's a, you know, a no brainer, but in many cases we, you know, we do see times where you, you think you're getting a PG 6428 and you really got a, a PG, uh, you know, 5822 uh, or whatever. So it, it's a, an opportunity to look at that. Um, so it's a, it's a device that shows promise for quality control and we're getting data in the field to help Turner Fairbank develop that potentially to the next level. Um, we also have the uh, FTIR device that looks at molecules. So that's a great way to check if you've got anti-strip in your uh, binder or not, if you've spec'd it out. And uh, we also have some other binder characterization testing that we can do. In terms of field tests, um, these are all looking at the post-constructed pavement. Um, we've got the PAVE IR device um, that looks at the real-time map temperatures, helps us be able to determine very quickly whether you've got some temperature-related segregation that's occurring. The MITSCAN T3 has been used um, very often on the concrete side to confirm in-place pavement thickness. It can also be used successfully with asphalt, um, just a little bit different in terms of the receivers that you place um, on your substrate. The circular track meter and um, also laser-based measurement devices that both are, can be used for measuring mean profile depth, which in turn you can figure out the macro texture and the skid potential of your asphalt surface. And then most of interest, many of you have probably heard about the dielectric profile system or DPS, Minnesota and Ohio and Alaska have really been kind of out on the leading edge of that. There's a DPS users group and uh, a pooled fund as well. And so we've got three of those devices actually, and um, two of them are just about to go out on loan to our first two states that are participating in the loan program. So um, there's a lot of different things here. We also have other support activities. Uh, obviously we've got capabilities to assist in um, pavement ME design, uh, uh, troubleshooting, um, not, not, not on the real basic project level, but kind of in general, if you're looking at implementing that, if you have some questions and that's, you know, something else that Jennifer Albert can assist with too in the resource center. Um, FlexMat and FlexPave, if that's something that if you're participating in the AMPT pooled fund study and you, uh, you know, are working with that, we can assist there. And uh, like I said before, also in terms of specification review. So we've been to uh, a large number of states since 1988. If you go to our website, um, you can actually search the map. Um, and uh, this allows you to search it for whatever you're looking for. So let's say that um, you're going to um, look into using asphalt rubber in your state, and maybe it's something you haven't done too much of before. You could actually search this map and you can find out well, what projects have we been on and in which states that used asphalt rubber. And depending how long ago the, the visit was, we may still have data for that. And moving forward, actually, um, from 2019 onward, our data that we generate will all be going into the info materials. So you may be hearing about the LTPP info materials and info pave um, tools soon, or if you haven't heard of them already. So our data will start to go in there and, and can be accessible. Um, what's a typical site visit? Um, excuse me, I have a, I forgot to remove these here. But um, it, it's all told it takes us about six months. We're really only on site typically for about three weeks. But um, as you see here, there's several steps that kind of encompass that whole visit. It's a, it's a big holistic visit. And so obviously we plan it. We've got to get logistics in terms of where you're going to host the lab itself. Um, we have a kickoff meeting. And that's really typically just going to be with your state DOT the contractor who's sponsoring or not not sponsoring but hosting us like allowing us to set up on their at their plant location or on their project location and the division office pavement materials engineer and so well we can do that uh part, partly on site or, or partly um virtually then typically we have an open house and that's where we really want to share about these different technologies so it's kind of a it's a whole day um it's typically almost a whole day the morning time we spend together kind of in a classroom setting. So a lot of times state DOT will host that in a division office or excuse me, district office, a district materials lab, something like that. And then um, we have the afternoon where we're doing tours. Folks are going through and 
and able to actually, you know, get hands on with some of the equipment and, and see how they work. And so we really encourage if we're coming out to your state or if you're having us come out, really encourage you to help us to connect with the LTAP, invite the local agencies. Um, we try to do, uh, you know, we're going to try to really move into offering it virtually simultaneously so that if there's folks that can't travel to it, but they could still attend virtually. Um, but really want to take advantage uh, to, to, to get folks in while we're out on site, get them, they spread the news out that we're there. Typically, we stay on two and a half to three weeks. Hey, for some of those folks that weren't able to make the, the tour, you can always set up a time. If you've got some, you know, district materials engineers that you really want to kind of travel in at some point during those three weeks that we're out there and spend part of a day with our crew, um, you know, you just have to let us know in advance and we can set that up so they can get some more detailed hands-on experience with the equipment. Um, that usually works well, kind of the second and third week that we're out there. The first week is a lot of material sampling and not quite the, the glamorous stuff. So um, we hold a closeout meeting. And then uh, in the future, our, our closeout really beyond just the closeout in terms of um, dealing directly with the contractor who hosted us on their project and the state um, material, uh, you know, bituminous materials engineer and the division office. Um, we are going to offer the quality in the asphalt paving process workshop, which will be a two day workshop. And you can invite um, a, a number of folks to that in to, to kind of go back to basics, talk about quality from the materials and construction perspective. And then also uh, we tailor that presentation to the results and observations that we had in that particular state. So what have we been doing this year since we've been the SATC, right? Stationary Asphalt Technology Center. Um, actually did a fair bit of work. And so you can see some examples here. We may have been in your state uh, virtually, but we did a number of specification reviews from different states this year, as well as doing some performance test analysis. So another thing is, I mean, you may have some states, you may have kind of gone a little bit down the path of doing some performance testing, and have some key questions in terms of how to analyze the data. And that's another way we can assist. Um, we had that situation with both Maine and Vermont. We're able to do some uh, data analysis for them to kind of help them get an idea of how they want to proceed moving forward. Um, we also did uh, virtual site visits, and you can see a number of states where we did that. Um, Florida DOT, from a couple of different perspectives. Right now we've got a Rhode Island DOT project as well. We're helping them with um, uh, balanced mix design and uh, kind of an introduction to that. Uh, Maine DOT looks like we're gonna be doing um, a split sample testing with, testing with the ideal running test. Uh, we participate in round robin testing for Caltrans and some binder test analysis uh, for Vermont and also New Hampshire, we have a project that's starting in the ABML ID lab for that. Um, you should start to see, if you haven't already, social media um, that comes out about every three weeks talking about the different things that we're up to in the lab, as well as you're going to see soon um, one pagers. I kind of described those and, and they'll be coming out soon. Um, so it just kind of gives you a little bit of a flavor when we do a uh, state visit with you or a site visit. We typically work with the division office and the state tumus materials engineer to, uh, to come up with a test plan. Um, and so that's pretty simple. It's usually about two to three pages long, kind of goes through what the goals are for the state DOT, um, quantities of materials, et cetera. Um, so actually, I, can, I forgot to update this. We finally just completed the testing for South Carolina DOT. Um, and so we'll be closing out with them uh, virtually pretty soon. We are also um, halfway through uh, so testing for Rhode Island DOT and Florida DOT is almost complete. Um, and we've uh, also completed the testing for California. So um, this just kind of gives you an idea about the performance testing analysis. What did that include? Um, and this is some data from the ideal CT cracking test um, and just some of the findings that we had. And, you know, the idea here is to try and just help the states have an independent view at some of the, the testing that they're, they've done, right? And so in this case, we didn't do any of the testing, but Maine DOT sent their performance test data to us and asked us just to kind of look at it and do some 
data analysis to help launch them on what their next steps would be. And their next step is going to be comparing those values and through the data analysis to the field performance. So they've got some projects picked out that they're going to compare to. In terms of specification reviews, this is a, you know, we put together a, a process, an operating process of how we do this. And it's very much um, a communication and a collaboration with the Federal Highway Division Office, material, Pavement and Materials Engineers. Um, and so what happens is uh, the Division Office works with the state DOT to say, hey, here's an opportunity to have portions of your asphalt um, and construction specs reviewed. You know, what would be of interest to you in terms of uh, learning more. And so you can kind of see, uh, you know, a little snapshot here of the, inter the internal process, how we do that, um, how the process works. But um, we put this together, um, you know, with input from our QA specialist at, at Federal Highway Concrete Technology Center. And um, this is something, yes, somebody talking. Okay, yeah, anyway, um, this is a, a, another support function that we have through our program. And here's an example of what we did with South Carolina. They had um, a desire to have their open graded friction course and their SMA um, specifications reviewed. Um, in addition, what we like to do is because density is a popular topic, we do a comparison of um, the, the practice in the particular state where we're visiting and compare that to some of the practices that were identified through the um, National Initiative on Density and just kind of see, you know, where there's areas where they uh, are, are aligned with some of those best practices that were identified in the, in the um, National Density Review. And you can see we had some other, um, you know, uh, spec reviews that we've done for Florida, Rhode Island, Vermont, and Ohio this year. Um, as I said, we're developing one pagers. It's an example of a one pager. Like I said, it's um, you know these uh, are we're deploying a one pager for each of the technologies that we currently have in our program. And as you see, they're they're literally a one pager. Um, they don't go into a lot of technical detail. We have technical articles and other types of um, more in depth information on data and practices that we can provide to a state if they're interested. But the idea with these one pagers is that it's something that you can really, in a snapshot, kind of understand the cost, the effort, the, um, you know, the, the accessibility and things like that, and be able to also look at those with, le with your leadership in the DOT or in your, uh, you know, with your paving partners, your state payment execs. Uh, we also provide some technology transfer, um, and so you're going to see, if, if you haven't seen already, for example, we have uh, a series of density one pagers. This is the an example of one of those that's in, in draft form that hasn't been released yet, but really what these are are trying to help you, uh, again, talk to your leadership in the state DOT or talk to um, folks in other units that aren't necessarily deep into the asphalt material side about uh, what is the what is the importance of density and how do you assess the density um, that you're achieving your state and what are things that you can do to improve it or you know what happens if you change something it, you know what if you're going to high um, recycled material percentages in your mix like what might change so you know just a lot of different things there and so there's more detailed tech briefs again that are kind of longer and more technical in nature, these one pagers are just sort of to give you the, a synopsis or like a cliff notes of those tech briefs. So then you can go, you know, with who, who you want your team to go and kind of read more in depth the tech brief. These will kind of give you a snapshot of what's involved. We're doing another series also um, on the dielectric profiling system. So you should hopefully see some of those coming out soon as well. As I said, we have an equipment loan program. The equipment loan program, uh, the way we like that to occur is to have that uh, loan request come through the pavement and materials engineer in the Federal Highway Division Office. Um, and they will submit that uh, um, loan application to our staff. Um, and so we have, as you see here, a list of the different types of equipment that we can um, loan out at this time. Um, and so 
Uh, there's a brochure on our web page you can see here and it tells about the different equipment and the process and actually like I said um, two of our DPS units are going to be loaned out this month one to South Carolina um, actually to Eurovia um, who is a contractor but the DOT obviously it, uh, is involved there so we 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 loan it both to industry partners and to DOT. So Missouri DOT is the other DOT that's going to have that. And right now, uh, we accompany that with training. Ideally, it would be on-site training. And in the future, once we're all allowed to travel again, we will have uh, about two to three days have a um, training that goes along with that loan of the DPS equipment and the pay-by-R equipment. Right now, we're going to handle those trainings virtually um, until we're able to start to travel again. Um, but one thing I want to kind of leave you with, and then I'll talk uh, a little bit more about the ABML ID program, is uh, we have a focus on quality. So one of the things I, I, I think it's important to, to, to ask yourself is, you know, how, how have you defined quality in your asphalt paving plan? Do you make decisions about when to use the right technology at the right time and the right uh, location? You know, why? Why do you decide to use the material that you use? Um, you know, it, can you do better? Um, is your state up to date in terms of a qualified products list? Um, do you talk to the folks in your payment design unit? Um, how informed are they about changes that might be going on, on the material side? And, um, you know, have you looked at your specs lately? And from what perspective? You know, have you looked at them, let's say, in, with a focus on improved durability? or improve safety or, you know, what, with what focus. So I, I just kind of reminding us that it's always good to, it's annoying, right, to go back and look at your specs, but it's always good to try and take an independent look at that. And sometimes it's easy enough to just, um, you know, we, we can offer that support. Let's see what areas you may want to focus on. And, you know, then the state DOT and division office can take it from there. Um, and then in terms of uh, the quality in the asphalt paving process workshop, like I said, that's a two day workshop on asphalt materials and construction. Um, we would like to see that the participation in that workshop be really half from industry and half from the agency, more or less, um, so that we have everybody kind of uh, the partnering together in the state when we're there. So in terms of the asphalt binder, um, Mixture Laboratory. It's a stationary lab that's housed at Turner Fairbank Highway Research Center. David Menching, um, who you're going to hear from today, is the program manager for that laboratory. And um, the purpose is to create active support mechanism for different types of um, implementation focused activities. Um, he's got one full time engineer and one half time technician that, and, um, and Basically, what what we how we work together is we provide um, at the Mobile Asphalt Technology Center kind of the the broader experience, right? So we're demonstrating test methods and all these different things that you see here in the shallow end. But in many cases, state DOT may require assistance that is what we might call the deeper dive. And so the ABML we created this laboratory to 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 function along with the MATC a couple of years ago. And the idea here is that they can provide that um, deeper dive, the troubleshooting, um, specific specification review on the binders, um, contribute to test refinement, look at uh, data sensitivity analyses, um, and provide that in-depth support. Um, and you see, if, if you, um, you, you'll start seeing these more and more, um, there's things called um, laboratory look-ins. And those are one pagers that talk about some of those deep dive projects that the ABML ID lab okay. is working on. Okay, so um, you can also uh, see that there's a project request process. So um, the idea here with the lab is that we really wanna hit um, short duration projects. So we're gonna take that deeper dive, but we want these projects to be um, efficient and move through and be high impact. And so typically they are going to be less than six months in, to completion, ideally. Um, 
they would be of interest to Federal Highway and multiple states. So it's, uh, you know, it's really got to be something that it's going to be beneficial for a number of states, the results that come out. Um, and uh, so the I process here is that you would send a request form via your Federal Highway Division Office Pavement Materials Engineers. And then there's a panel um, that actually reviews those project requests that come in and, and rank those in terms of um, whether to proceed and, and, uh, and so on and so forth. And so um, they are, one thing is before the project even starts, the products that are expected to come from that project really need to be envisioned ahead of time again, because we want this to kind of move through quickly. And um, we do have uh, updates that happen every six weeks with the, the originator of the project idea. And so we've got some projects right now that came from state DOTs directly uh, through their pavement materials engineer. And then we also have other projects that have come as a result of outreach to the resource center or through the mobile asphalt technology center. And this is just a snapshot on um, some of the projects that are currently underway. We have uh, uh, you know, um, really about 10 projects that are going right now, um, some that are um, uh, completed as well. And you can see they range everything from questions about um, automated extraction and binder testing to um, also looking at um, the macro texture on dense graded um, asphalts for higher speed, um, you know, minor arterial and collector distribute type roadways, um, questions on SMA, um, kind of a, um, you know, a retrospect, SMAs have been around for, you know, 15 years or so now, um, you know, are the, are the mixes the same as they were 15 and 20 years ago? There's probably some new things in those mixes that weren't there before. And so are the current design procedures for SMAs uh, really the targets where they should be, or should we be looking at something different? And it, again, this supports some question, a question actually originated in Washington State DOT, and uh, a couple of other states said, yeah, we're kind of interested in that too. Um, so I want to wrap up and give Dave uh, a chance to talk more, but uh, we do have a website. You can see the web address here. Just uh, go to Federal Highway, type in Asphalt Trailer, and it'll bring it up. And we've got a, a lot of the information I covered today that's in our website. So um, if you want some information, my contact information is here, um, and I can send you a brochure that talks about our program. Um, so with that, go ahead and If you will. Uh, thank you very much, Leslie. Um, we we're going to take a pause here for uh, to see if anybody has any questions. There's a couple ways you can do this. You can either raise your hand or you can type in the chat pod. Uh, Leslie, I do have a couple questions mm -hmm. for you right now. Um, the first is, what is the intent? to develop FlexPave software knowing the majority of states either implemented or are moving toward MEPDG. Is it better than MEPDG by any aspect? Oh, okay, well, that, that's a good question. Um, and so we we aren't further, we, I mean, our, our program isn't further defining FlexPave. In fact, um, I think Flex, well, FlexMAT and FlexPave, I think, really are more of a way to evaluate your mixture design, right? So maybe a tool to look at your mixture design um, using some of those tests that give you fundamental properties to, to assist in potentially um, um, refining your mixture design approach. Uh, we do not, and, you know, I, as far as I know, Federal Highway, we do not want... Uh, you know, intend that to be something that would be a, a flexible pavement design tool. It's really more of a mixed design um, tool that you could use. Uh, so I wouldn't be able to comment in terms of is it better or, or different than MEPDG because it's really not the same kettle of fish. Um, but Dave is on and Dave might comment to that as well. He's got a lot more uh, time working with FlexPave and FlexMAT. Sure. Uh, Dave, do you have any anything to add? Um, the only thing I would I would add is just, um, you know, Leslie's 
right? It, it's really being uh, used as a mixture performance comparison tool. And so, you know, if you've got novel materials that you're comparing maybe with, you know, a more routine mixture that, that you've been using in your, your area, um, the tests that are required for uh, both FlexMAT and eventually the FlexPave analysis would um, shine a useful light, but that's that's about all I can add. Okay, thanks. And then Leslie, one more question: uh, Where are the one pagers available? Yeah, so they will be available on our website soon. Um, all of the headquarters websites are um, in flux at the moment. Uh, they're making changes and and. Uh, I forget what the word is now. For. They're they're uh, Heather. I don't know what's it. They're taking the websites and they're making it from one platform to another or something like that. So going to Drupal. It, yes, <laughs> that's good. So um, they will be available. Look, if you're interested in any that you saw today, um, just shoot me an email and I, we can send it. We'll be we'll be putting them through the discipline. Uh, you know, pavement materials discipline. Um, listserv soon um, and also uh, the density ones are starting to get populated now on the asphalt density web page and also externally we're going to release them through guff delivery and the payment materials listserv there so um, so they should be coming we're going to try to stage them out you know kind of have them come out over time um, keep people interested but if there's anything you're interested in straight away shoot me an email and let me know okay great i think that's all the questions we have for you at this time but like i said at any point in time if anybody has any questions feel free to type them in the chat pod or you can raise your hand um not seeing any more questions i think we can move on to dave's presentation um, Dave, just a note that you can um, have Amanda advance your slides or you can share your screen, whichever you choose. I'm going to share my screen. Thanks, Jen. Okay, thank you. All right. I trust that you all can can see it, uh, see my screen. Um, yes, but it's, all right. it, yes. Can you show it in the presentation? Yep. Okay, perfect. Good. All right. Um, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are. Um, happy to, to be with you and, and share uh, some information from Turner Fairbank and uh, the research side of, of asphalt materials here at FHWA. Before I get started, I want to thank uh, my co authors, Amir Galalapur, um, who now works in uh, resilience and surface characteristics for FHWA. He was formerly a uh, member of our lab here. And then Michael Elwardani, who's uh, our new contract lab manager. Uh, first slide is acronyms. Um, just leave it up here for a second. Uh, these are, you know, we're gonna, you'll see these throughout the presentation. Um, most, I think, most of us, I think, will be familiar with the acronyms, but um, here it is for your reference. My objective today is to go through an overview of the Asphalt Materials Research Program and provide an update to one of our research projects that I think is of interest to many of us in the asphalt materials realm. And that would be our mixture performance test comparison study, or uh, we call it the rodeo at Turner Fairbank. I think I've heard others outside uh, call it the rodeo if they've gotten wind of the, the nickname to it. But um, I've got an update to share there as well. So I want to start uh, first with the issues facing um, infrastructure and therefore asphalt pavements in the U.S. And you know this this list of issues here really crafted um, the strategic plan overview uh, for the asphalt materials research program, which was done in uh, June of 2019, and um, you see the issues listed here. We have increasing traffic and climatic demands, uh, increasing competition in the global marketplace, changing quality and quantity of natural resources, 
this evolving world of automation and uh, the endless internet of things, which I'm sure is, has permeated all of our lives in some way. Um, and then, you know, this, this last item here, we have uh, a level of decreasing experience and availability for uh, agency workforces. And so all these issues kind of bring us to a point in uh, our program and, and research where we need to be agile. We need to be able to respond to multiple issues that are pressing at a given time. And um, we took a look at how we how we uh, manage projects within our program, um, really to make sure that we're best responding to stakeholder issues as they come to our attention. So uh, here's a strategic overview of the Asphalt Materials Research Program. Um, the mission is stated here. I hope you can read it well. I guess there's a bit of a contrast issue here, perhaps. But uh, the mission is to lead with world-class expertise, technology, and innovative research to solve unique problems of national interest um, and ensure the mobility and economic vitality of the American infrastructure system through the development of long-lasting, safe, and sustainable asphalt pavements. And we accomplish this mission by focusing on three strategic objectives, um, people, technology, and innovation. Um, you see the objectives listed here. People, our goal is to address stakeholder needs by building a strong research and deployment focused partnerships and bringing high level researchers into our program. Uh, technology, really we're just looking to uh, improve existing technology to address the needs of stakeholders and then as it relates to innovation, our job is to develop practices and tools for practitioners which improve longevity, safety, and sustainability of asphalt pavements. Uh, within those three uh, strategic objectives, we have what are called focus areas within our program. And so each project that we do um, over at, at Turner Fairbank in the Asphalt Binder and Mixture Laboratory falls into one of these uh, seven focus areas. And so the ones that are ongoing, we have uh, long life wearing courses, performance specifications, wrap resin, sustainable materials, and refining the binder specification. Uh, emerging topics include automation and artificial intelligence, um, bridging the gap between materials and the wave of connected technology that's, that's coming about, and then uh, a focus a future focus on resilience in asphalt materials. Now, the structure of our program, um, I believe Heather mentioned in the, the bio that we have the asphalt binder and mixture laboratory um, at Turner Fairbank, which engages in research activity and, as Leslie mentioned, the implementation and delivery uh, portion of the lab, where we're really taking a deeper dive on some of the issues facing some of the more immediate issues facing stakeholders. Um, we also tap into the pavement test facility, PTF. Many of you know it as the ALF accelerated loading fa uh, facility. And then for as needed efforts connecting certain dots, certain gaps in research, we can use um, out of house contracts. Uh, we have a few of those within our program. And then we, uh, we try to tap in frequently to visiting scholars, whether that be through internships or postdocs or uh, visiting professors, perhaps on sabbatical or, or some other arrangement. I want to just uh, bring your attention to a few of our, our focus areas and projects that are ongoing in those focus areas. This is not a comprehensive list of our research at um, FHWA as it relates to asphalt materials but it's just a few highlights for you. So in the long life wearing courses area, um, we are researching along with domestic and international partners, uh, epoxy modified asphalt. And the goal right now is to uh, explore epoxy modified asphalt's potential to extend the life of open graded friction courses. Um, we've got an upcoming, well, we have a current, actually a current uh, ALF project on field density that started in 2016 and should be wrapping up sometime this year. And then uh, a future ALF project on pavement preservation and rehab. 
that's in the planning stages. In the performance specifications area, we have the rodeo that I'm going to provide an update on in just a minute. And then we've got uh, two other projects I want to bring to your attention. One is streamlining performance tests. Um, right now, there's so much discussion in, in our field about mixture performance tests and incorporating those into uh, a balanced mix design and perhaps ultimately into uh, a production setting, you know, in, in acceptance. Um, our goal here really is to just take a look at commonly used tests and um, identify ways to make the test shorter, right? Um, and we're doing that through the Agile method, um, which is kind of a unique spin on, um, on managing the project. And we think it's provided us with some high quality findings to this point. Um, and then the third would be the Asphalt Research Consortium field cores. These are a unique set of materials that uh, have been on, on the ground for uh, quite a while, I think upwards of 10 plus years. And we're actually sampling these materials and um, monitoring the, the uh, performance properties over time. Now in the automation and artificial intelligence area, this is a broad area. It's, it's gonna be continuing in our program for some time, but right now we're, we're focusing on uh, applications for pavement performance simulation to reduce the testing burden. Um, if we have commonalities in materials, it's possible that, that the use of AI or machine learning can actually um, you know, provide us with some shortcuts um, so we don't have to be spending as much time and money getting our, our results. Um, and we're also looking into deep learning applications to provide mixture and binder performance insights to inform innovative material development. And uh, with some of our partners, we're looking to develop an international symposium to get at the issues surrounding widespread implementation of uh, artificial intelligence in the asphalt area. Now, as it relates to recycled materials research at FHWA, um, we're looking at stockpile consistency with a, um, a mixture test that requires um, no compaction. You take the loose mix, you throw it in the compactor, and um, you can get you know relevant properties out of that, which may be able to um, provide the same information that we're getting out of extraction recovery using solvents. Um, as a follow-on to that project, we're going to begin looking at mixture design optimization with RAP and RAS, integrating with, with AI. The Rodeo itself includes RAP and RAS materials, and then the ongoing uh, recycled materials ALF study, which I think many of you are familiar with. Uh, that started in 2013. And um, it touches on aging, it touches on wrap and rash, structural modeling. And then we also kind of uh, fell into some work with uh, re-refined engine oil bottoms, which found their way into the, the, some of the binders at that, uh, at that site. So we'll be commenting on that in the upcoming final report in about the, the next year for that. I wanna shift gears now to the uh, rodeo experiment update. And uh, the rodeo, we've been presenting uh, pieces of information from the rodeo now for, uh, I'd say, a few months. And uh, the rodeo project is a three-phase effort. And um, the first phase is really just taking a look at reheated materials that we have available at Turner Fairbank with uh, six different tests. And I'll, I'll show those in just a second. Those tests were selected by a group of stakeholders from around the country. I think some of you uh, are on the call today, so thank you again for your participation and insight. Uh, phase two of the study, which we've started here at Turner Fairbank, and we're closing in on completion of it, uh, incorporates lab aging. So we selected two different lab aging uh, protocols and, and subjected those same materials to that with a truncated uh, test matrix. And then phase three is really just uh, using state materials. 
So we reached out to a number of, of state DOT partners. And if you're interested, we perhaps you can reach out to me uh, after this presentation. And we're taking those uh, state materials and subjecting them to the same aging and testing scheme to provide states with insights on how their materials fare across different performance tests that are being looked at for a balanced mix design application. So right here we've got the uh, ALF materials and in the rodeo we're actually using five of the 11 lanes um, from this particular ALF project. So you'll see in this matrix here we have, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but um, lane three is a 64 minus 22 with 20% 20 RAS. Uh, that's measured by ABR. Uh, Lane five with a 6422, 40% wrap. Lane six is a 6422 with 20% wrap. Lane seven being a 5828 with 20% RAS. And then lastly, lane eight, a 5828 with 40% RAS. Okay. And so we took these five different materials, reheated them, and subjected them to the test that I'm about to, to talk about here. So the first presentations that we put out related to the rodeo were geared more towards uh, comparing these tests when looking at crack initiation performance, uh, performance to the point of crack initiation. Um, you see on the on the screen here, we've got the ALF performance plotted. You have accumulated cracking on the y-axis, number of load passes, and um, we took this the cycles to first crack in the first part of the effort. And now we're starting to look at propagation rate uh, through slope of accumulated cracking versus load passes. And you'll see that lanes five and eight are kind of bunched together. That was not um, expected when we designed the experiment. We've had um, a moisture issue in the substructure in lane eight, so it failed uh, prematurely. Um, but it's worth noting here just for the, the sake of clarity. Uh, lanes three and seven, these are both the shingle lanes. And uh, crack, uh, crack initiation started at different points, as you can see, but the slope of the propagation is actually quite close, which is interesting to us. These lanes have also experienced uh, transverse cracking which we didn't really expect to happen in uh, Northern Virginia. So we're kind of taking a deeper dive into how that happened and what that means. Um, excuse me. We've also got lane six, which as you can see has separated itself from the pack. And so we've got these observations that we've listed here on the right. Lane five performance is similar to that of lane eight. Lane three performance is better than lane seven. And the difference there is actually the virgin binder grade. Um, so one is the 64 minus 22, the other is 58 minus 28. Lane three is better performing than lane five, and then lane six is much better than all the other lanes uh, in this, this snapshot here. Next, I wanna just show um, extracted and recovered binder data. This is Delta TC. Uh, with time across the five, uh, actually this is six different lanes. We have the control shown here as well, lane one, which wasn't in the mixed testing part of this project, but um, we do have extract and recovered binder data here. And so you're, you see that for the most part, uh, we have a, a, you know, Delta TC is becoming more negative as the material ages. We do have some instances where um, you'll see here lane, th uh, lane seven at three years had a, uh, a warmer or a less negative Delta TC, which was unexpected. Um, we're looking into this more in our lab as to whether or not this is an issue with respect to uh, extraction recovery processes and the variability we might see, uh, whether this is a, a variability issue tied to, you know, Delta TC itself, or whether this is a uh, homogeneity issue, you know, maybe there was some, uh, the RAS wasn't spread evenly throughout the lane. These were sampled at different points 
in time and at different locations within a lane. The next slide shows the double edge notch tension test, the dent, um, also on extracted and recovered material. And generally we see a decrease in the CTOD, the crack tip opening displacement, which is a measure of strain tolerance. Um, as the material ages and becomes more brittle, we do expect uh, a decrease in the CTOD. Where you see missing data points, maybe in here, lane three, for example, um, the material itself was simply uh, too brittle to, to, to test. Uh, the dent is, is looking at ductile failure, and uh, if the material is, is simply too stiff, it's, the test just isn't going to work as prescribed. Now, moving into the mixture evaluation, these are the six tests that were chosen um, in consultation with that stakeholder group. And um, they're the Texas Overlay Test, the IFIT, Illinois Flexibility Index Test, the Ideal CT or the uh, ITC, Indirect Tensile Cracking Test, um, the Cyclic Fatigue Test, ASHTO TP133, which is coupled with dynamic modulus testing, um, the IDT NFLEX test, and then the Cantabro test, uh, which we consider more to be a, a durability indicator as opposed to a cracking indicator. But um, we thought with the potential for long-term aging the materials and, and um, you know, the Cantabro could provide us with some value as to how these materials are changing from a durability perspective. So I'm just going to highlight three of the tests here. Um, three of the, the tests that we're kind of hearing a lot about lately. Uh, the first being the IFIT. Uh, we've got the table on the left showing the different lanes just for reference. And what we did was we reheated the material, subjected it to the ASHTO TP124, although uh, I was recently informed that this test was... Uh, published as a full standard, so I do need to change that designation. Um, but, um, and you see the results here. So on average, we had a 30% coefficient of variation um, in our IFIT results. Um, and you see the statistical grouping here using uh, the Tukey approach. You've got lane six and lane eight with similar performance according to the variation we saw. Uh, lane seven is kind of in its own statistical group, and then lanes three and five are similar. Um, this, there's some discrepancy as to how that actually matches up with the field, and we think that that's uh, mostly a product of the high COV. Moving on to the ideal CT. Um, this test, you know, it takes about uh, five hours in our lab to do three replicates. Um, we had an average COV of 18% here, so uh, less variable than the, the IFIT. Um, and you see the results shown on the, on the plot to the right. In terms of statistical grouping, we had lane eight separated um, by itself, followed by lane three and six grouped together. And then um, lanes three, five, and seven themselves were also a, a, their own group. One thing we're looking at more deeply um, here in this study is how the, the grouping um, matches with the field, obviously, but also if there seems to be a systematic misranking. So if, for example, the RAS materials are always in the same statistical group, but lane five is perhaps different. Um, this might kind of shed a light on whether or not this material is, uh, you know, uh, biased in a way towards a, a certain material like RAS being in the mix or stiffness dependent. Um, that's kind of our next phase that we're gonna, I'll touch on very briefly here, but um, we are looking into that more in the future. The last test I want to show is just the cyclic fatigue test. Uh, again, ASHTO TP133. This is a pull-pull test done in the asphalt mixture performance tester. And the index that you get out of this test is called SAP. Um, SAP stands for apparent damage capacity. And 
um, it, it kind of couples stiffness and, and toughness together. Um, we have quite a range of, of values here. There's actually a tech brief that came out from FHWA recently that provides more information as to uh, ranges of SAP values for particular pavement types um, or, or asphalt mixture types. You see in the statistical grouping here, lane eight is again by itself in its own group. Lane six is in its own group. And then lanes three, five, and seven are uh, in its own statistical group. Now again, lane eight, some of these tests were able to, uh, to, to discern that lane eight was the best performing material. Um, of course, one of the, the drawbacks to, to this study where it stands today is uh, the moisture damage issue that we had in the substructure on lane eight. So we don't, we don't actually know how well lane eight would have uh, performed and if this would have matched up. But lane six seems to be a, a good performer compared to lanes three, five, and seven. The last uh, bit of information I want to show as it relates to the first phase, the reheated samples would be the uh, dynamic modulus data. We looked at the dynamic modulus um, itself at, uh, I believe this is at 21 C and, and 10 Hertz. I, uh, I'll have to go back on that. Phase angle at that same, uh, at that same point. What we looked at as well was the mixture Glover row parameter, um, which was uh, probably published about five or six years ago now in uh, AAPT proceedings. And um, really what it does is it's, sub it's substituting the complex shear modulus from the binder with the uh, dynamic modulus from the mixture at the same uh, temperature frequency condition as the binder Glover row parameter. Um, what we're doing with this data, as I mentioned, is coupling it with the various cracking tests we did to see if there's, um, you know, if there's systematic agreement between a cracking test and the stiffness uh, measurements that we, we came up with. Now, phase two of the effort, I just want to touch on it very briefly. Um, is long-term aging. And we chose two aging methods that um, are under discussion right now as it relates to laboratory aging. One is high temperature, short duration. That would be uh, eight hours at 135C. And that's from work out of uh, TTI and NCAT using the cumulative degree days approach. And then the other method we used was uh, out of NCHRP 9-54, which is lower temperature, longer duration aging. And um, for McLean, Virginia, if you were to look at the, the maps developed in that NCHRP project, um, you would be, you would be uh, aging mixture at three days, 95C, to get at eight years of aging uh, at, I believe, 20 millimeters under the surface. Uh, and so here we just have the Glover Row uh, mixture parameter. And what, if, what we find interesting, and we're, we're doing more with this, is um, the ranking of eight hours versus three days does kind of flip-flop, but there's a lot of overlap as it relates to whether there's statistical significance between the, the, the results. Um, when we go to the cracking tests, uh, some of our preliminary work to this point shows that there's still this flip-flopping of the ranking, but the, uh, the difference between the two, eight hours or three days, um, does change more significantly than it does with just looking at stiffness or stiffness and phase angle in this case. Um, there's more to come on that, but it's, it's possible that from a, uh, a cracking perspective, eight hours at 135C has a different impact to the material than it does when you're just looking at linear viscoelastic properties. And I've, here's the statistical grouping. Again, we have lane eight and lane six by themselves in separate groups. 
Um, lane seven in this case is also in its own statistical group. Now, when we go to the long-term aging, we have a, a tightening, uh, as, as I mentioned, and we have less statistical groups. Lane seven has now joined lanes three and five, which we actually saw in uh, a few different cracking tests. Future work, um, we're continuing the effort on the loose mix aging, as I mentioned. We have pavement performance simulations um, ongoing through partnership with uh, Argonne National Laboratory to redu reduce testing burden through machine learning applications. We are looking um, where possible to add recycling agents and look at dosages based on binder and mixture, linear viscoelastic properties. And um, again, looking at mixture performance on the cracking side after long-term aging with and without recycling agents to provide some more insight to our partners who um, are, are either using recycling agents or perhaps are uh, interested in using them moving forward. So that's the end of my technical presentation. I need to provide this disclaimer that the US government doesn't endorse products or manufacturers. Any trademarks or manufacturer names that appear in this presentation are only because they are considered essential to my presentation's objective. They're included for informational purposes only and are not intended to reflect a preference, approval, or endorsement of any one product or entity. Uh, if you have questions that we can't get to today, or if you'd like to participate in the rodeo experiment or some of the other work that I, I mentioned here today, please feel free to send me a, a quick email and um, be happy to chat with you further. Thank you. Okay, okay. Thank, thank you very much, Steve. Have an echo. Um, I do see that uh, we have one participant with a raised hand for a question. Um, Ala Moseni, do you have a question? If so, you may unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Oh, okay, yes. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dave. Very interesting uh, presentation indeed. Uh, as you may know, we've been working on the same uh, tests for a number of years, more than 10 years now. Uh, uh, you know about IRLPD test, which is now H2TP116. And especially the uh, new version, 2020, uh, we have a method A, which can actually determine the mixed high temperature PG of the mixture. And we use uh, volumetric uh, samples, which means no sample preparation, essentially. You just have to, uh, uh, we got very good results uh, in uh, some of the mixtures from Missouri, from, from Maryland, uh, and now Maryland is trying it right now. It can be of great uh, benefit, I think, to your program. We also have, you mentioned the uh, artificial intelligence, the AI. Uh, we have the icicle test, which can give you three times better precision than BBR. In half an hour, it gives you the low temperature properties, including the Delta TC. And we also have now a completely new line of testing, which is a MASIC test. We are trying it in Minnesota right now, where you can actually get a lot of mixture parameters in a very, in like a one hour, something that you need to do a few days to actually work uh, to get. Have you considered or will you be interested to consider uh, new technologies that would uh, significantly improve the testing time and precision? Of course, yeah. I mean, Allah, we've, we uh, thank you for the comment. We've got um, we have various methods where um, we can either have individuals, um, and I think you've visited us a, a time or two uh, since we're we're close by, um, to 
you know, share thoughts or, or demos or whatnot. Um, we have methods to, to do that. We also um, are always interested in hearing more. So, I mean, if there's additional literature or um, conversations that we can have with you and the, the DOTs that you're working with, um, we'd be more than happy to, to engage. Well, I really appreciate it because you mentioned that, you know, your uh, new technology, uh, mm -hmm. like a new work would be our uh, 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 work uh, that we've done on emulsions that significantly uh, improves uh, the emulsion technology. But uh, if you open an avenue, we'll be willing to actually participate in all your programs uh, to show the advantage. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Looking forward to, to that. I'll, um, my email's here if you just want to, you know, send a, a, a message and we can take the conversation from there. Okay. Uh, Dave, I do have a couple questions in the chat pod. A reminder to everyone, you can raise your hand and unmute yourself and ask a question or you can type in the chat pod. Um, I have a kind of a question here from um, David Painter. It looks like you're still online. Um, he made a, a, a comment, extend the life of OGFC, but end the ability to carry water. So I'm not sure, <laughs> David, if you want to unmute yourself. There you go. Uh, yeah, I was uh, I was curious about uh, your one of your uh, topics, which was the use of uh, uh, epoxy to extend the life of OGFC. But I was wondering if it also ended its ability to uh, wick water away from the roadway. Could you uh, talk about that for just a second? Yeah. So um, the the short answer is is no. Uh, it would not uh, end the ability to carry water. But uh, what what we're seeing is um, in New Zealand and um, in the Netherlands, they're using this material. It's a, it's a diluted epoxy modified asphalt. Um, and there are there's a, a few different uh, vendors or, or manufacturers for this material. And um, what we're looking at is uh, how it, it's, it's a thermoset material. So it, it, you know, it's curing with time. And um, we're looking at whether or not it's workable and whether or not the, uh, the properties and the, the chemical compatibility is there for it to be used uh, in a you know, widespread application. I mean, we're, um, we're working with, here in the US, we're working with NCAT and FDOT on that. Um, we've got some of their materials and we're gonna be starting to mix the diluted epoxy modified asphalt um, and, and, you know, doing Contabro testing, doing uh, some of our workability tests that we, we, we can get at here in the lab. Um, but my understanding from the successful trials in, in New Zealand and uh, the Netherlands is that it isn't impacting, um, you know, its ability to carry the water. Do you have any papers that you've uh, put together on that, that you could shoot to me? Yeah, so we've got, uh, in terms of papers, we're actually sending one through publication now. So um, I don't have a paper, but we did present some of our work at the Peterson Asphalt Research Conference um, in Laramie, the Laramie, Wyoming, I think this past year. Uh, I can share that. I can share, you know, other details as to where we are, what our experimental plan looks like. We've got, you know, this is a, a big undertaking for us, this epoxy modified asphalt project. And so it's got multiple uh, phases and elements to it, but I'd be happy to share more with you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, and um, I also see that Casey Nash has a hand raised. Casey, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Hey, Dave, uh, Casey Nash, main DOT here. Um, I was just wondering, did you guys true grade 
uh, the binders and, and some in the, these mixtures because you know I, I all all the analysis that everyone's showing is the PG grading um, and 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 then show, seeing the variability between the same PG grade, um, but no one's reporting it as far as being true graded. Yes. Yeah. We, yeah. We have that. Um, I didn't present it here, but uh, yeah, we we do continuous grading on everything in our lab. Um, the actual numbers, I yeah, I don't know if I have that off the top of my head. I think uh, I think our sixty four is uh, a, you know around a sixty seven true grade, and uh, the the wrap itself, I believe, is a ninety five on the high end. And and uh, the resultant material blended with the various wrap and ras binders, did you grade those as well? Yes. Yeah, we have that as well. I don't have the numbers off the top, sorry, Casey, but uh, we've done continuous grading on everything. Uh, Dave, uh, I have one more question here in the chat pod. Is FHWA looking for ways or means to eliminate the need to take field cores for acceptance testing? We have heard that some DOTs are looking to move away from requiring cores are there technologies or equipment on the horizon that could be utilized and accepted by FHWA? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, I can provide a little bit of information on what we're doing in research, although um, I think actually Leslie might be the, the better person to tackle this question um, because she's actually looking at these technologies uh, in the, the MATC. But in our lab, um, we're taking the alpha materials, the, the component materials, uh, mixing them in the lab and providing them to our non-destructive evaluation laboratory, who's going to be looking at uh, these types of technologies. DPS, uh, I believe, is, is one of those. Um, and I know uh, the NDE program manager, Hoda Azari, is working closely with Leslie and her group, or is going to be once they, they get that project off the ground. Uh, Leslie, do you have anything else to add on that? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question, Charlie. And um, I, I, I think my understanding from the states who have been working with this most closely in terms of, at least for the um, dielectric profiling systems is right now, it's more of a, a way to identify um, better random sampling of where they're going to pull the cores. And um, also when you're actively paving, once that finishing roller goes by, you can also uh, make some adjustments. Like, so since you're out there and you're, and you're able to just, you know, read the, read the surface, the dielectric properties of the surface, if there's areas where there's problems, it, it's a great way to immediately talk with the contractor and make adjustments on on the fly. So instead of having like a large area potentially where you've got issues with segregation or other types of issues, instead you can kind of nip that in the bud and make adjustments more quickly. So in terms of whether Federal Highway would um, accept coreless, uh, you know, I would say that's probably not on our horizon right now. I have talked with Jeff Withy um, and Dennis Dvorak and they could probably give some more information on that. But I think right now it's more about how can this technology enhance what we're currently doing, make smarter decisions about, um, you know, how to choose those random locations for cores and, um, and see what other uses there could be. So, uh, like I said, we do have three DPS units um, in our program that are available for, for loan. And so, um, you know, so we'll see South Carolina and Missouri are gonna be the first to, to borrow those and have the training. Um, but any other questions, feel free to reach out and, and we can give you some more information. Okay. Um, I think that's all the questions that we have at this time. So I'm going to ask Heather to join to close yeah. us out. So with that, this just a reminder, we have two more um, webinars left in our series. The next one's going to be February 24th on concrete or concrete program areas. Um, 
from here on out, we will be using our newsletters to communicate all of our program area updates, pro program area being the pavement and materials program. Uh, the newsletter uh, link listserv, if you want to join that newsletter, um, we're going to put that in the chat right now, the link to join. The first one went out today. So if you did not receive a newsletter with this little heading, that means you're not on our, our um, email list. So you may want to join. Um, if you don't want to receive it, you can always you know, unsubscribe subscribe if you accidentally got it. But what's important is this newsletter will be releasing when, you know, new up new materials are published. We'll reference them in the newsletter. Webinar series from our program area will reference in the newsletter. Any upcoming events or rulemaking such as the pavement design rulemaking that just is just was announced. So um, be sure to sign up for our newsletter because I think that's a important way that we'll be communication communicating with you guys in the future. Next slide. Um, if you do need a, a survey or PDHs or want copies of the presentations, be sure that you access our survey. At the last question, that's where we have a, a spot slot to add your email address so that we can be sure to get you the materials. Um, with that, we do take the survey results seriously to improve our program and continuously provide um, our, our content and program areas. So um, with that, that's all I have, unless there's any other questions. The survey link is also in the chat pod, so you can click on the survey link. You could also log into the survey by um, www.menti.com, and then there's a code here that's listed. You could enter the code for 35518988. That would be the code. Um, if not, I, we look forward to our next webinar and seeing you in February. Thank you. Thank you.